Hello, everyone. Uh, we're back for uh, finishing up Rawls today. That's the main the main agenda. Um, and we got a lot of the, the setup for it, but I want to check in with everyone who's in the chat this morning um, about how things are going. Um, how did all this stuff about the veil of ignorance and justice being set as a process to try to deal with biasing issues of people uh, basically adopting a conception of social justice that suits their interests but doesn't necessarily take into account everybody or is fair fairness is the big thing for Rawls how did how did Friday's lecture go anyone have some leftover questions I, I want to check in before we get into the substance of what Rawls thinks we're going to decide under the veil of ignorance in the original position as to what the rules of justice will be and all that stuff about like uh, the benefits and burdens of cooperation, like how how social cooperation's benefits and burdens ought to be distributed. That's the main question we've got. It might be because I've heard of it in a prior philosophy class, but his writing comes off really clear. I mean, I, I think there's a there, there's kind of a a big difference in reading stuff that was written in the last 50 years versus the last like 300 years, much less <laughs> something that was written even further back than that um, but Rawls is like a lot of contemporary philosophers really interested in trying to not make complicated stuff more complicated than it has to be it's not that older philosophers didn't care about that but um, there there's just also differences in style of writing like it's he's speaking your language right he's a more contemporary person Still having trouble with the definitions of contractarianism versus contractualism. Okay, um, I can help with that. While I'm talking about this, anyone else, please drop questions and things uh, in from Friday uh, into the chat while I'm while I'm working on this one. Okay, so um, contractarianism thinks that uh, the rules of morality. So these are these are meta-ethical theories. So this isn't just about social justice or political philosophy, but this is about morality generally. Both contractarians and contractualists think that moral rules come out of the agreements that we make with one another. <laughs> Pardon me. Mm. Um, they think they come out of agreements. But somewhat idealized agreements, like uh, basically agreements that are rational. Um, so, so not irrational agreements. But the contractarian thinks that the principles of rationality that people would agree to, or that people would make agreements under, uh, is defined by self-interest. So whatever, if we're thinking like a social contract extension of this, um, it would be like, a, a contract between people for mutual benefit, um, self-interested benefit, is how the contractarian thinks about things. Contractualists think about the agreements that would ma be made between rational people um, under some kind of premise that's much more like Kantianism, uh, a Kantian understanding of rationality that would invoke things like the the way in which it under Kant it's irrational to treat other people as a means as to your own selfish ends um, so the contractualist would say well, you got to be thinking about the kingdom of ends right or universalizing maxims and then the agreements that people would make like in a kingdom of ends that defines the rules of morality Kant is not a straight-up contractualist but contractualism is an extension of a Kantian notion of rationality that then sets the construction of moral truths. They're very, very close to each other. Um, I can, and the names are really close to each other, so it's easy to mix them up. And I was saying that Rawls is not entirely one or the other um, because of the weird way that under the veil of ignorance, we're still supposed to be selfish, like we're still thinking about self-interest, we're motivated from self-interest, Rawls thinks, and it's sort of rational to do so almost, um, but he's neutering the way in which uh, self-interest could exert a contingent bias on what agreements we're going to make, because that self-interest doesn't have the facts necessary to be able to pursue one's 
contingent ends over those of others because you don't know who you are. You don't know what your circumstances are under the veil of ignorance. That information has been suspended or sort of quarantined away from your attention. Is that helping, Mark? And is there any anything else from Friday's lecture that people in chat want to ask about? Cool. Awesome. Everyone else is doing okay? Ready to, to get started for the next thing? Okay, looks like it. Not here for many other people, um, but I, I, I hope it's going well. Um, don't Please don't be shy about asking questions. I do think while Rawls is a little easier to read, um, his theory is by no means uncomplicated, um, and it can be a little tricky wrapping your head around something like the veil of ignorance and how we're supposed to make decisions under it. Um, this has been one of the most common criticisms of Rawls, is that without knowledge of the particularities of our situation, we wouldn't be in a position to be able to make any decisions over any other decisions. Um, I think that criticism itself is evaluating it gets into some pretty deep waters here to figure out whether it holds but there's a really basic way in which it just fails and that is that um, and this is something I was trying to emphasize in Friday's lecture for Rawls um, it's not that we can't know about particularities or to imagine to like use our intellectual empathy in the kind of Kantian sense to understand what would if I was in this position, what would I be concerned about? What would be what would I see as in my interest or not in my interest if I had these values or these values, or if I was a member of this religious tradition, I subscribe to this vision of happiness or or whatever, right? So we're still able to know about particularities. It's not like Rawls is saying anything that is a particular has to be disregarded from from our decisions about how to set up the principles of social justice. Um, it's more like, because I don't know which particular person I am, I have to take into account all of them. Or maybe we should say each of them. Each of them has to be sort of on the table. I can't ignore some people in certain positions because they might be me. <laughs> and I, wanna, I would want to self-interestedly protect my interests if I happen to be that person. Here's a, here's a quote I want to read here. Or, or let me give you this one last, I already said it, but it's so worth repeating. The question here of social justice, as Rawls frames it, and even as Nozick and many, many other people here um, that are, are talking on this kind of level. The question is, if we're going to be a society, we are going to be engaging in a system of, some system of cooperation. Even if it was oppressive, it'd still be a system of cooperation. This is a point I've made before. And systems of cooperation have unique benefits and burdens. And what is the proper distribution of those? I used an analogy of a group work project on Friday, and I think that's a really good example to kind of have in the back of your mind in terms of what you have to be thinking about here. here here's the quote. The intuitive idea is that since everyone's well-being depends upon a scheme of cooperation without which no one could have a satisfactory life, the division of advantages and burdens should be such as to draw forth the willing cooperation of everyone taking part in it, including those less well situated. Yet this can be expected only if reasonable terms are proposed. Now, on Friday I was talking about how if we're thinking about a negotiation where people would consensually agree to something, right? Like my example of having the jobs and you needing the jobs and I'm offering the low wages and you'll agree to it because what else are you going to do, right? That kind of scenario presupposes a bunch of rules of social justice or basically a, a social order. It doesn't necessarily presuppose justice, but that there's already some rules set up for how we engage with one another. If Rawls is wanting to talk about what should those rules of engagement look like, 
what should contextualize or frame what is what are the kinds of negotiations possible in our society then um, <clears throat> we can't operate it f with the presupposition of the existing power structure right if uh, would someone if you can imagine given that I've been given power over the means of production the faculty or the the, the um, factory and you know that your livelihood depends on being able to earn an income through employment then that's what compels you to accept my low wages and take the job uh, the, the low wages that I'm offering but what if we were we were wondering like would you agree to a setup in which you had you were forced into a choice like that and the answer would probably be no and that's the kind of level on which we're thinking about principles of social justice under the veil of ignorance is what should even be the rules of the game and if the rules of the game are skewed in some unfair way then people wouldn't agree with that they'd be like no let's do a different system in which I can get some more benefit from my situation right but there could be somebody else who then is got the short end of the stick right and Rawls sort of I think there's an implicit diagnosis that all discussions of social justice up to this point that don't use something like the veil of ignorance are basically just fumbling around this way and passing along the unfairness from one group to another so you'll have one system of power in society set up and some people are getting screwed by it it's not fair to them and then maybe things happen a revolution occurs or something else and the the social order is changed and then that now there's somebody else who's picking up the short end of the stick and this is just going to get keep getting passed around by whoever whatever interest group is able to take control of the levers of power um, and we're not going to really get anywhere even when those people are making those revolutions or those changes in power under appeal to moral principles of social justice He's really worried about them being skewed, or like we were talking about before, biased. So what are we going to agree to under the veil of ignorance? I, are, is everyone with me so far? How's this going? Is this going good? Really wish I could see your faces right now. Going good? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um... Don't be shy for someone to say no. <laughs> I don't want to, uh, if I lose anyone on the train here, I want to get you back on. Um, okay. So the first thing that Rawls says is that we're not going to agree to utilitarianism. Um, and the reason is because of the self-interested component. So he still allows us to be self-interested. Rawls is kind of not comfortable with the idea that for the greater good of society, we're going to throw some people under the bus. So we're going to be like, well, we can make this whole system of social cooperation run the most ideally if these people take a hit for the team. Um, if you were asked in your like small group work setup to be like, well, the, the best product for this group work is if you do all the work and then we're going to do nothing. Would you agree to this? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe out of the goodness of your heart, you might choose to do that. And Rawls isn't against people like voluntarily choosing to sacrifice their interests for those of others. Like if people say um, volunteer and join the military and serve you know, the interests of society this way at great personal sacrifice. Uh, or volunteers or all sorts of cases of sacrifice. Mill wouldn't, or I'm sorry, not Mill, gosh, uh, Rawls. Rawls wouldn't be like this is wrong or immoral. What he would be against is a system of cooperation, like a power structure in society that demands this out of some people. That is saying, like, you are going to sacrifice your interests for the sake of us all, and you don't get any voice or say in that. That, it, that it's coerced by the, the system itself. Um, I was mentioning last week how there are some modern economists who think that this is actually a necessary feature of capitalism. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I mean, we can debate that. It's part of economic theory to figure out how does this thing function or how could it function. Um, but it does seem like this happens very often, that you've got a system of cooperation that works pretty well, right? It's, it's pretty functional, but not for everybody. It's not serving everybody. I think a lot of the systems of social organization in the world today, if not all of them, uh, work this way. 
except in rare exception cases, maybe smaller communities, things like that, if we're talking about them on the level of governments and whole countries, there's always some part of the population that's really not being served by that system, even if most people are, or even if it is like very efficient in the big picture. Okay? So Rawls is going to reject utilitarianism because he thinks people under the original position won't buy into that because they're still going to be concerned about their self-interest. They don't want to run the risk of being one of the people that we're all saying, yeah, you got to take one for the team kind of thing. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> is that making sense? Okay. I mentioned that... Um, there's a deep connection here between Rawls and Kant. So when we're thinking about having this debate under the original position and what principles are going to be proposed as the rules that will define social justice and create the ground rules for how we're able to interact with each other, like what is permissible spaces of agency and what are impermissible spaces of agency, how, say, taxes are collected and where those tax dollars go, um, there, there will be room for democracy here. Um, Rawls is not imagining um, that we set up the ground rules in a way that decides every single minute little decision that everyone makes. It's not like when you're, say, let's say there, there is a some kind of market, maybe some kind of form of capitalism. Like Rawls doesn't seem opposed to capitalism, even though his theory is going to end up entailing a probably something like democratic socialism, honestly. Something very similar like Bernie Sanders kind of stuff. Sanders isn't a full-on communist. You know, he's a democratic socialist. Even though it's going to look like something like that, there's probably still going to be, so there's still going to be a market. And it's not like every decision that's made between business partners or competing businesses or something like that is necessarily going to have to be judged under the veil of ignorance. But we do want to be thinking about what are the parameters of what people are allowed to do or allowed not to do? So even if there's, say, a free market, this is a really silly example, but even under a free market, um, there's still going to be rules like you can't buy and sell people. Like slavery is not, that, that crosses a line, right? We're going to lay down principles of social justice that say, yeah, you can make choices about what you want to do here, but these are not available choices. Right? That, something like that might happen. Can I define democratic socialism? Um, so the uh, de democratic part is important to basically distinguish it from something like Stalinism, where you've got some uh, totalitarian, authoritarian state that's making all the decisions about how the resources get distributed in that society, um, deciding about, like, uh, who, like you, in Stalinism, you basically had Stalin and a small cadre of political elites that are pulling, they're, they're playing all the cards. They're making all the choices. They're making all the calls about what should happen. Um, <clears throat> democratic socialism still has democracy here in terms of leadership and decision making. That is arrived at through a democratic process. But it's socialist in the sense that the state really is... Um, taking on a more expansive responsibility in sort of promoting people's well-being um, and instead of instead of private ownership having more control in that society so you still have the government um, doing things like say redistribution of wealth or providing lots of socialist services but all of those are still happening in the context of democracy okay um, <clears throat> those those functions of government are still decided upon democratically um, if it's just instead of uh, it being private businesses or private interests that are uh, say providing health insurance the state is doing that democracy in the workplace is a huge aspect of democratic socialism if I'm not to be mistaken um, <clears throat> there are different versions of this um, I mean uh, we're we're going to talk about this more uh, this week when we get into Cohen, so I'm I'm kind of hesitating on on doing a whole bunch of it now. But there are some 
fairly still extreme notions of democratic socialism, that it's not just a matter of retaining a democratic political system where people get to vote on their leaders and things like that, um, but it also sees uh, democracy in socialism, so or or even you could say democratic communism. Imagine that instead of private citizens privately owning the means of production like the factories and the businesses and all that kind of stuff, they are state owned but run by the people that work them. So the the uh, they're sort of the people that say work at the company are the ones who are making the decisions about how that company sets its object objectives and manages and that kind of thing rather than all the authority coming from the owners or the stockholders right uh, if you want to if you're really interested in this take my business ethics class because we get into this a lot but under the current sort of way that things happen um, businesses are run in a sort of de facto even quasi contract sort of way um, the managers like the CEO and everything they're supposed to be taking into account the interests of the stockholders and running the company for their benefit for the benefit of the, the private owners but under uh, communist systems where things are communally held like the company is communally held the workers are the owners and the managers those are all sharing the same role and so there's some people who say this is way more democratic than a, a capitalist system that a capitalist system is actually anti-democratic um, but this is this is kind of a little bit of a deeper discussion is this what you had in mind Anthony with de democracy in the workplace yeah yeah okay cool all right so going back to Rawls and the veil of ignorance Rawls thinks there are two principles that we are going to agree to under the veil of ignorance that are going to be the sort of big principles that set the guidelines for everything else that happens in society um, oh I was on a tangent and then I, I got distracted from it so Rawls is very Kantian in the sense that under the veil of ignorance I have to think about these rules for society in light of all the particular circumstances that I could find myself in and that's like Kant's universalizing a maxim and seeing if there's a contradiction there can I will an agreement to this rule under all the possible circumstances and if the only reason that I would agree to or reject a rule is because of my personal circumstances then that rule is not universalizable Okay, there has to be a universal basis for being able to rationally assent or affirm uh, a rule for conduct, a maxim, a prescriptive rule, um, no matter what the circumstances are, for it to be justified under Kant. This is very similar to what Rawls is doing, too. He, he's saying, but this agreement can only be expected if reasonable terms are proposed, basically terms that are reasonable to everyone in society that it's not like some people are getting overruled or thrown under the bus for the sake of everybody else but also no one can assert their interests to the expense of everyone else too and this might seem like it's a in unsolvable riddle like <laughs> there's no way for society to operate without someone have taken a hit right but this is where um, Rawls's cleverness really comes out in terms of how what he thinks we would agree to we recognize that in joining into a, a system of social cooperation, I'm gonna not have, I'm, I'm not gonna be the monarch. I'm not gonna have absolute power to do everything I want. Um, but also, I can't be, uh, if it's a just society, I'm not going to be the slave either, the person with zero agency, zero power, their interests are not being taken into account at all. Instead, we would get, <clears throat> I, I kind of, maybe I should turn my hat for this, I think it's something kind of like maturity you know as a child you're growing up and like you have no authority your parents have complete say over what happens to you <clears throat> and then you might start getting older into adolescence and being like fuck you parents like I don't care about anything that you say and then maybe you mature past that point and then you're like oh, okay alright 
I'm starting to understand what it is to live in society with other people. I don't always get my way. I don't get just do everything I want in inconsiderate interest for other people. But also I need to have some self-dignity here and recognize that I do have agency and dignity and choice <clears throat> and I should use it. I, I can't just be deferring to everyone else around me all the time. That I, I do my own interests matter as well. So getting into that kind of balancing act, that's a lot of how I look at uh, what Rawls thinks we're, we're thinking about when we're deciding these principles for social justice under the veil of ignorance. So there's two principles that he, he thinks we are going to agree to in the original position. One is the justice term. So <clears throat> here's a quote from him. Each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberties compatible with similar liberties for others, which is a very classical kind of liberal philosophy line here. Um, we want people to have as much freedom as possible. Um, people do want to have as much freedom as possible, <clears throat> but the, the constraining condition is if you're going to have this liberty, can everyone have that liberty? That's the main question. Um, Rawls thinks that there's going to be, that this is going to entail things like political liberty, like democracy, um, right to vote, the right to run for office, <clears throat> to get the votes, freedom of speech and assembly in the press, liberty of conscience and freedom of thought, like the mill stuff, right to hold personal property, that's how the capitalism part still uh, is retained under Rawls, and freedom from arbitrary arrest and seizure, Miranda rights, all that kind of stuff. Now, whether he's right on the details of this is definitely a place of controversy. But, um, in other words, what are those particular liberties that we are going to be wanting to protect under this system? Some people have been like, man, Rawls, you sure sound a lot like a lot of developed Western nations here. Like, first world Western democracies is what you have in mind as this universal conception of justice. And there could be other conceptions out there that you're not thinking about. And I think that could be a fair criticism of Rawls. But it doesn't necessarily mean that his whole theoretical project is bunk. Because those, just like we've talked about with many of the philosophies we've studied, the basic principles could be solid, and it could just be that the philosopher is not doing the best job or the most rigorous job, or that there are better answers out there for how to extend those principles into more of the practical substance of their manifestation. And I think that that's maybe the case that could be here. Um, I don't think we're going to get to it today, but you remember I promised last week I really wanted to talk about this theory from Martha Nussbaum, where she argues for a, a way to understand uh, human rights that she calls the capabilities theory. And I, I wanted to actually bring that in as a way to unpack Rawls's uh, first principle, the, the sort of justice term. But for today, let's focus on the second principle um, that is probably the most famous and most talked about aspect to Rawls's theory, and that's called the difference principle or the maxi min principle. So here, the here here's here's what uh, Rawls says: social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both a reasonably expected to be to everyone's advantage, and b attached to positions and offices open to all. Now, part of the consequences of this, I don't know if this is the most direct and intuitive way of describing the maxi min principle. I've got a little bit better way, I think, of articulating it. But one thing you can get right off the bat is that Rawls is not opposed to inequality. He thinks inequality could be the fair thing. That fairness doesn't demand straight equality. So here, here's my way of describing the maxi min principle. And let's put another idea back on the radar here. Prior to any society, any social system of cooperation, not everyone is the same. People are in different circumstances. I mean, just think about um, like what's going on with people's bodies. People's bodies are in different states of affairs. Um, but, uh, and, and that's not, um, it, it, it isn't as though um, you we can, through society, rewrite all of that or somehow make everyone equal but we do need to think about that so that's not uh, the basic inequalities or difference we should just say difference that people exist in in a state of nature 
is not necessarily a moral thing. It's not like people who are stronger deserve their strength and people who are weaker deserve their weakness. Or There's no moral content to that. Um, it's not like there's a moral story behind why people are in the circumstances that they are that are not the social circumstances. When it comes to social circumstances, there we've got agency. We can do something about that. And that means that it's a space of morality. So we can ask the question reasonably, what should society's attitude or way of dealing with the fact of basic inequalities, what should that look like? What is the just way to deal with that? So you might imagine, let's say, uh, going back to your group work scenario, that the first proposal is that we divide up all the work evenly and we all get the same grade. So the benefits and burdens are distributed perfectly equally. Everyone's going to spend the same amount of time on the project. But everyone who is working on that project is in a different position. Some people have some skills, other people have other skills. Some people have more burdens outside of school than other people. Some people are just like, I'm very affluent, I don't have to work a job, I'm, my only thing to do here is schoolwork. And other people might be working two jobs and have a family or other kinds of things going on and being a student at the same time. Like People just don't have the same circumstances. So that may not be the best way to define fairness, to just say, let's just split it up evenly. Or to say, like, uh, if we're going to think about taxation, everyone has the same, like a flat tax. Everyone pays the same amount to the government. That may not be equitable. <laughs> As many people have been remarking throughout the, qu the quarter, when it seems like punishment has been a, a real big focus for people's interest this quarter in this class. Um, We've talked before about how proportional punishment is important for just punishment. That the same punishment for one person doesn't mean the same thing for another person. And there's big ways in which trying to talk about equality of how the rules are set up is actually disproportionately affecting people in an unfair sort of way. And this is something Rawls is very sensitive to. So he's saying, imagine that there's a kind of um, baseline that would be perfect equality across the board, okay? But then maybe we start messing with it a little bit. But maybe we start giving some advantages here or putting some extra burdens here and we start distributing it in an uneven way. What could get people to buy into that? On what principle or rationale would we be cool with some kind of unequal distribution of special powers or privileges or certain types of burdens or costs, like what would what would be a way to justify that, that people in the original position could agree to? And the answer is this maxi min principle, that basically we are going to opt for a system of social cooperation in which the people at the very bottom circumstances of society, however those end up turning out because of our choices about the system, are elevated to as high of a possible quality of life as 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 we can consistent with the first principle remember the principles of justice so you can't start sacrificing certain basic liberties to make this stuff happen um, but we're trying to it's called the maxi min principle because we're trying to maximize the minima so if you got this range of like where you could end up in this society that's being proposed you want to take that bottom floor and raise it as high as possible. And Rawls thinks the, the rationale for why people are going to agree to this is that they're going to hedge their bets. They're not going to opt for a kind of 99, 1% economy hoping that they're the 1%. You know, if you've got like 99% of the population that's just in abject poverty and then the 1% is living this best possible material life that they could with all these advantages, people, people aren't going to agree to that under the original position out of self-interest. They're going to hedge their bets. They're going to be like, I want to protect my ceiling uh, or my floor rather than uh, try to maximize my ceiling. Instead of letting the top part be as high as possible to maximize the maximum, instead we want to maximize the minimum. What if I get the worst luck? What if my circumstances are in the worst possible position I could be in? How could I be in the best possible position under those circumstances? That's the maximum principle. 
And Rawls does think that it's going to involve an unequal distribution of benefits and burdens. And this is where I was saying Rawls is really going to start looking like socialism. That socialist policies and principles and uh, programs are going to are aimed at trying to improve quality of life for the people that are on the bottom rungs of society. And if someone was like, well, it's not fair for me to be paying my tax dollars for the these people to be doing better, right? I'm not getting any benefit out of it. You get that argument a lot. Or also just be like, what are you talking about? Of course it's fair, because it's what you'd agree to under the original position. There's another quote I really, really like here. Um, so, uh, yeah, here it is. So, entitlement, just like for Nozick, what you are entitled to, like say your property, is decided after the standards of social cooperation are established, not before. So, property rights are not natural rights. They're not. Um, they're 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 the product of us deciding on this agreement rather than something that's premised before it. Uh, so so look at this. Um, the more advantaged representative person cannot say that they deserve and therefore have a right to a scheme of cooperation in which they are permitted to acquire benefits in ways that do not contribute to the welfare of others. I think that captures the whole game there in just like one, one nice sentence. That's what Rawls is thinking. Do you deserve your natural advantages? Well, no. I mean, yes or no. It's just not moral if you have natural advantages. The thing where justice comes in is that you don't deserve a system of cooperation that allows you to leverage that over other people without their consideration in mind. Yes, I can repeat that, Angela. The more advantaged rep representative person, so by advantaged here we mean maybe natural advantages, like what's going on with your body and your brain like maybe some people have born with higher IQ or some people have um, bodies that can do things that other bodies can't right um, or how your um, how like the chemistry of your brain is like the hormones and just the, the kind of like life experience you're dealing with right um, all these different personal circumstances that are purely a matter of luck in how you're born right that if you have advantages there you cannot say that you deserve and therefore have a right to a scheme of cooperation, a basically a social system, cooperative social system, in which you're permitted to acquire benefits in ways that do not contribute to the welfare of others. So basically, Rawls is arguing against a libertarian, free market, capitalist kind of way of setting up society of like, uh, you can compete with each other as much as you like and no restrictions or rules on it. Just go for it. May the strongest person win. Ross is like, no. That way of setting up the rules of a system of cooperation is not going to elicit the buy-in of the people who aren't capable of competing in that. Right? Even if you don't have money, if you are poor, let's say you are uh, on the street, you still have to play by the rules of social cooperation that allow all the big business people to wheel and deal and do all the stuff that they're doing. You just don't get to participate in it because of how the rules are set up. You're excluded because you just don't have the means. Now, the people who are defending that kind of system would say, well, you're not excluded. We're not kicking people out of the free market. You just don't have the money to be able to participate. But would you agree? Let's say you knew you were in that position or you were worried you might be in that position. Would you agree to a system of cooperation in society where you have to basically not get any advantage so that other people are able to leverage their advantages over you? That's not just a rhetorical question. <laughs> Do you see the, the logic that Rawls is going for here? We get choices about how we want to set up this system of society. And if that system of society is set up in a way that is not looking to the advantages of everyone who is going to participate in that system to make that system work, then that's not a fair system. And in order to elicit that buy-in, we use the maxim in principle. That even if you are in the worst possible circumstances in society, we've set it up in a way where your participation in that system puts you in the best possible position you could be in. 
So even if you're not a big wheeler and dealer, even if you're not able to compete for the very best of the opportunities that's, that are pr possible in that society, your, your interests are still being taken into account. And we're definitely not going to be violating your basic liberties. That's the first term about the justice thing, the human rights stuff. Okay. That's how this is supposed to work. So it might be that we agree that um, I'm going to let this other person have these extra benefits, like maybe some control of the means of production, that it's not going to be perfect even across the board. If it means that it's going to actually work to my benefit, I might be willing to make that kind of a trade, or that it would be reasonable to expect that kind of thing out of someone in that position. So that's how this is working. I also might be cool with the, the benefits being broken up in a different way, too. So um, even if I'm way at the top, right, that I'm going to be like, yeah, it is reasonable to ask for me to pay a, a progressive income tax, you know, to pay way more to taxes um, or at a higher tax rate than people who are on the lower parts of that are more impoverished than me. Um, because the only reason I have all the wealth I do is because of a system of cooperation that required their participation. Even if they weren't directly involved in the economic transactions, they, had, they have to play by the same rules of how the economy works or how all of society works in order for me to be able to take my position and create these advantages out of it. So it makes sense that I need to be supporting social systems that work to those people's benefit via the state. So that's, that's where you get the socialist sort of part of it. How's this going, everyone? We've got a few minutes left here. I wanted to, this is a really big idea, um, and especially the logic behind it about why would people under the original position agree to this. How, how's it going so far? Good? Great. Cool. Doing good. Okay. Um, there's a there's a lot more I want to say about roles, so we're gonna we're gonna spend some more time on roles tomorrow. Um, before getting into Cohen. Cohen's really tough. And I, I'm sorry I, I've like, I was great so much this weekend. I was not able to get around like I anticipated to putting some comments on Cohen. Um have not talked about the code, I need to do that. Um Shoot, what's going to be the code? Um, how about alarm? Alarm is the code for today, since I slept through it. Um, that's what's salient on my mind right now. <laughs> so alarm is the code word. Um, yeah, so there's some, some more stuff about roles I want to talk about. I want to talk about ableism, actually. Um, I think ableism is one of the best ways of kind of getting inside Rawls's head here and what conception of social justice we're running with and how to understand the system of of social cooperation and what parameters of fairness would look like under that. Um, yeah, that's right, Schauke. Um And I also want to talk about Martha Nussbaum tomorrow and human rights and the justice term that's the first term of what Rawls thinks we're going to agree to under the veil of ignorance uh, as a principle of social justice. Mark says, so people with greater natural advantages owe their benefits to people with less natural advantages. Yes, under the grounds that they require the participation and the cooperation of people with less advantage. Just because those people aren't able to say, uh, like, like it, Rawls is sort of calling out as sort of bullshit the idea of good-for-nothings or freeloaders. As if people who are on the bottom rungs of society, say the unemployed, are not contributing to society. The mere fact that they have to play by these rules of private property and livelihood as the means by, or uh, employment as the means of livelihood for people to get their basic needs met, is a massive burden. That's a massive social burden that they are having to play by those rules. Um, there's other ways that we could set things up. I mean, we could just do full-on communism. Rawls doesn't think we're going to do that either. Uh, but why wouldn't we, right? Why wouldn't we? We can't presuppose that free market capitalism is the most just arrangement here. We've got to think about what's going to, who is this affecting? 
And can we elicit the buy-in of everybody, this universal buy-in for whatever systems of society we're going to set up? That's another really good way to think about roles here, is that instead of it, the maxi min principle being a positive principle, it could be also conceived of as a negative principle. Any proposal for how we set up society that cannot elicit the universal buy-in rationally of everyone who's in society in a way where we're not presupposing that those rules are already in place and that someone is coerced into agreeing or consenting to it, that's a deal breaker. If you can't get that universal buy-in from everyone in that society, then that's not a just society. That system of social cooperation is not just. That's how Rawls is thinking about this. Okay, um, I gotta let you go for today. I got another class coming in here, so uh, we gotta stop for now. Um, but uh, I'm looking forward to talking about this more with you tomorrow. And I'm sorry, the Cohen reading is really tough. Even if I put some comments in there, it is still going to be a slog. Uh, and we'll unpack it in class together, and I'll help you out with it. Um, so um, don't panic. <laughs> and thank you for trudging through what is going to be a very difficult reading. Right off the bat, it's like, what is he talking about? about freedom, all this stuff about how he's defining freedom, really weird and paradoxical at the beginning, but we're going to, we'll make sense of it together in class, so, um, I'll, I'll, I'll help you out with that. My, my request is just read the reading, get familiar with the language, pick out what you can, and we'll make sense of the rest of it in class together. Okay, so long. <laughs>